lately. This is awesome. Um, so we're here to talk about bicycle and pedestrian county equality, and we have some wonderful presenters here today um, from the city of Vancouver. We've got Winston Chu. We've got uh, Jean-Francois from EcoCounter, who's looking at accounts from around the world. And we also have Sean Turner from TTI, who's done some excellent analysis both on motor vehicles and is bringing that knowledge to bicycling and walking. And I'm going to say a few things, too, from the national perspective. I'm Krista Nordback. So welcome, and let's start with Winston. Hello, good morning. Thank you for coming. It's really great to see so many people interested in quality counts. Um, as Krista mentioned, my name is Winston Chow. I'm with the City of Vancouver. I'm the Acting Manager of Streets and Electrical Design Branch. And um, in my, one of my former positions, I was responsible for overseeing the city's uh, count programs. Um, I'm still involved with that, given that I'm in an acting role right now. And uh, it's a real pleasure to come to speak to you about how we develop our count program for active transportation. <clears throat> So before I get into the details of our program, I uh, just want to provide some context. Uh, if anyone who has not seen this before, uh, this comes from the city's uh, tra transportation 2040 plan, uh, and which sets targets uh, for the city. Uh, you can see here the chart. Um, the, the plan was developed in, in 2012, um, and we looked at data from 2008, and we projected out what would be 2020 and what would be 2040. Um, the real cool thing about it is that uh, last year, 2015, we actually reported that we met the targets in terms of reaching um, walk, bike, and transit as 50% of our um, sort of target for trips within the city. And so we reported that to council, and we're actually going to be moving forward with uh, reaching two-thirds of our trips uh, within the city by 2020. So it's just pushing that target you know, even closer. And it, um, it kind of sets up um, the whole count program within the city of Vancouver and why we need to have accurate counts is just reporting out those targets uh, and also to tell council about, you know, with specific projects that we work on, um, you know, what the trends are, uh, what we've achieved. Um, if we're building new bike infrastructure, walking infrastructure, um, it's critical that we are able to demonstrate and show uh, in a quantitative way um, you know, what we've been able to achieve in, in the investment that, this, that we've been making in the city. Um, so there's, of course, follow-ups uh, reports as part of the Transportation 2040 plan. Um, there's the city's website where we post on a monthly basis uh, a number of locations, nine locations in total, where we have uh, permanent bike count stations that we report out. Um, <clears throat> and we have, uh, within the city, uh, a couple of these uh, display boards. Uh, which we're showing uh, to the public um, what the sort of accumulated total bike volumes are. And so for us, um, you know, using this data is just critically important that we have, you know, accuracy and precision and, you know, credibility in ensuring that, you know, whatever data we release to the public, uh, that we are confident that it is the most accurate uh, that we can uh, sort of achieve uh, with uh, the methods of data collection that we have. Um, so in terms of data counting methodology uh, within the city, um, you know, a few, you know, basic things here. Uh, we've got, you know, the standard manual counts where staff actually go out and uh, do counts on a routine basis. Uh, we have um, up to, uh, you know, during peak times uh, in the summer, we may have up to 25 auxiliary staff uh, within the city that go out and do counts uh, where we're um, looking at um, locations where we're not able to uh, install permanent counters just because of the nature of the limitations of permanent counters uh, and technology. Um, and also like verifying uh, what the counters are giving us, the data. So we use the manual counts as a way to check um, what the systems are giving us. Uh, so we're using that. We have we use video as well. We've done some um, video analytics uh, that we use. Uh, there's some technologies out there that provide that type of counting. And uh, the next two are really, um, you know, the automated type counters. So we have uh, counters that are, you know, portable. Um, as you can see down here, um, the hoses uh, that we would lay in a bike facility, a separated bike facility, and also uh, embedded loops. 
um, and so below that. So those are the permanent counters that we would install. And um, okay, I'll talk a little bit more about the specifics on how we how we use them and how we design them. So uh, you know, developing a quality count system within the city. Um, we have about, I'll talk mostly about uh, bike counting. Um, that's really where our expertise is right now. We're starting to get into more of the pedestrian counting systems and looking at those technologies, but really our base knowledge and that we've grown significantly over the last five years is, is the bike counting. Uh, and so these icons, it's a little hard to see, but essentially what we're looking at here is um, an interface uh, through our um, vendor who provides us with the equipment. Uh, this is about 60 locations that we have in the city where we have permanently installed bike count stations. And um, so there's, in, in designing and installing, um, you know, these, there's, there's key components that we look at, uh, which I'll get into of, of how we implement and uh, develop a quality count program within the city of Vancouver. Uh, so the design of counters, um, you know, the key components, uh, like principles, uh, it's given the nature of how much time I have, I can't really talk about the details of, you know, designing these. So really, I'm just going to focus on uh, the principles of it. And, you know, within the city of Vancouver, uh, given, you know, the, the level of scrutiny we have on, you know, bike counts, um, and even the data when we report to council, um, the requirement that we have to provide you know, um, good quality data, um, we had to establish an acceptable level of accuracy with the counts that we were getting with these automated systems. And so we came to the place where we needed to be within 5% uh, margin of error. Um, so within that 5 to 10%, 10% uh, is kind of getting towards the threshold where we would start to really question the data. And so I'll talk a little bit more about how we uh, check that and verify it, but that's kind of one of the overlying, uh, overarching principles in design. Uh, you really need to first establish like what, um, what what's acceptable to your organization. Uh, what is the data going to be used for? Um, and then that helps you with the whole des design uh, process because as you get to know the technology and know your facilities, you'll understand what the limitations and, of the technology are, right? And so then you'll realize that um, although you may want to have counts in specific locations, you can't, you basically cannot capture it with the technology that's out there, right? So really, you know, the second two points is just the limit, understanding limitations in the technology, and then just being aware of pedestrian and bike behavior. Uh, and that will really help you in terms of uh, designing, um, you know, these count stations, where to put them, uh, where they work, um, and just learning from past experiences. Um, installation of counters, um, you know, that going from design to installation, um, attention to detail from what we found is really of um, utmost uh, importance. Um, you know, as we, I put up this picture here, this is, for those of you who are familiar, you know, you'll see that, know that this is the Burrard Cornwall location where we have one of these display boards. And, um, so we found that through this site, it was actually getting fairly within our 5%, but we were actually overcounting. And what we realized here was that we needed to uh, deal with this location uh, in a way to ensure that we're getting uh, accurate information because people were really looking at this and questioning the data. And so we actually went in, uh, although we installed it and it was getting you know, relatively good information, we realized that we actually need to reinstall it. Right? Um, so really it's, it's basically uh, don't settle for less. Right? So if it's Questionable, um, you know, obviously it, it was a new facility. We didn't have, want to have to go out there and reinstall this thing. The optics of it wasn't good, but in terms of our credibility in the data, we kind of made the decision that we had to go back and <coughs> reinstall this device. Um, maintenance and operation, um, it's, it's critical, really. Um, I think a lot of agencies install these devices and just basically leave them uh, and then start to get data from them. Uh, and they don't really invest in the ongoing maintenance and operation of it. Uh, just as, as an overall with the city, um, we spend about $7,000 per uh, location. So out of those 60 locations, on average, we spend about $7,000 per location. 
Uh, and what that really includes is just having our vendor come out, check the locations on a routine basis. Uh, we have staff that will actually do verification counts. So for the locations that we post on the website on a monthly basis, we actually have staff that will go out there uh, to uh, verify those locations uh, and ensure that uh, they sort of are within that 5% of margin of error. Um, I know I'm running out of time here, so I'm just going to uh, run quickly go to this last slide. In terms of principles in, you know, in data programs, um, these we developed a, 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 a traffic count strategy in 2013, and um, through that whole process, these are some of the key guiding principles uh, in our data and, and our whole data uh, traffic. Um, collection program and strategy and so the, the main things is really the truth in data the data integrity you know ensuring that you know your program is credible um, that whatever data you release there's truth in it uh, that and there it's you know the raw data and so, itself you know there is integrity in it and, and I think some of the other things um, you know they kind of speak for themselves they're pretty self-explanatory so um, I think I'll just leave it at that um, and um, I'll end the <coughs> presentation there, and I think we're going to take questions yeah, at the end. Let's take yeah. questions at the end. Okay. Right. Well, thank you. Um, when Krista and I discussed about uh, when Krista and I dis uh, discussed about this presentation uh, back in January, I think we really want to do something a little bit different, uh, maybe a bit nerdy. So uh, um, Winston really uh, well set the table about what it needs, how it looks uh, from the, the city perspective. Um, I'm going to talk about some very, very specific things uh, that are not general, uh, but um, just wanted to let you know. Um, so. Our company, EcoCounter, maybe one thing to know is that uh, we've installed 14,000 counters in 45 countries. Um, so we, do, we only do bicycle and pedestrian counting systems. So, so that gives a, maybe a perspective. Um, this is not new information, but if someone does not know, it's possible to count bicyclists and pedestrians in multiple ways, uh, either permanently or temporary uh, for uh, multiple purposes. Uh, it's done uh, in a lot of places and in North America, again to give you some, some perspective, we have about 425 clients and, uh, and, and the programs have different size. You know, they go from one counter to 140 counters. So um, there's a threshold when you go above 20 or 30 counters, depending how you are set up in your city, uh, where management of the program becomes a real issue or becomes a real subject. And it really needs to be, uh, you know, taken care uh, seriously. Um, so, in that sense, um, I want to overview some of the different steps that we think that are important to have a healthy counting program. A lot of it uh, um, refers to what Winston, Winston said, but uh, it's kind of nice to take them one by one. So. The installation is very important. Uh, quite often, if you have a contractor that is doing the installation, you need to make sure the contractor has the same level of commitment or same level of uh, involvement with the accuracy. So making sure uh, the installation is done properly. Uh, calibrate and verify uh, to make sure that the equipment has been installed properly, but also uh, to verify that the equipment is working well or as it should. Uh, understand your data. Um, one thing is usually a counter will cover a certain part of the roadway. You might have bicyclists that will be riding on the sidewalk or that will be riding in the travel lane. So uh, uh, San Francisco uses the, the bypass ratio uh, for every single <coughs> of their counter. So when they, when they do manual counts at their location, they will also uh, count the people that are not riding on the counter. So give them an estimation of people using the whole roadway. So understand what you, you, you know, understand your data. Uh, document everything. So especially for portable counting program, you have equipment that you move around. So this equipment uh, uh, is collecting data a certain period of time. So everything needs to be documented very well. So you can later access the, this data. And, and the management of the database is also um, important. Um, allocate field resources. Vancouver definitely has a Cadillac of the field uh, resources for account program, but, but you do need some field uh, uh, resources. 
uh, to go check on the equipment and change the battery, make sure uh, it's okay. Um, schedule maintenance, make sure you can go and see uh, uh, the, 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 the counter and, and check that everything's okay. We had a, um, um, a, a case in, in Colorado uh, where uh, we got a call from the, the client saying, well, the counter is no longer counting bikes. So um, we went with the client to the counter and it turns out that the, 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 the shoulder has been extended. So, so the counter that used to be on the shoulder was in the middle of the roadway where there was no bikes. So the, the bikes were riding <laughs> in a different place. So you need to check these sites uh, uh, sometimes. Um, also challenge your equipment provider. You get the best uh, out of the equipment if you really uh, uh, push the vendor, make sure that they stay on top of things, use their technical support. Uh, uh, we think it's important and we think you can get more out of it into this. And there's also one specific thing uh, is manage your internal knowledge uh, with, with you know staff turnover and uh, um, city uh, uh, conditions that people move around. Uh, um, the knowledge is important, so so we do our best to assist our client, but um, um, making sure that you know you allocate time and people can can do this. So from our perspective, that's kind of the the recipe for for a complete. Again, it's redundant with what Winston has said, but uh, from a different angle maybe. Um, I want to talk about data management specifically, so very specifically, uh, in how you will look at uh, the data. Um, if you have 100 counters, again, it's different than if you have one. So, so these these things are important if you want to grow your program. So, so the first thing is is you want to check your data and you want to have automatic checks uh, on your data, so the easy stuff can be identified by a machine. So, if you're counting thousands and thousands of people per hour, then there's a problem. So you get an alert and then you you. Um, you can quickly react to this. So email alerts or statistical verification, they're a really good way to, to have this done. But you also need to have local eyes, like human eyes, that will be able to look at the data using the no local knowledge. The bicycle traffic is much more volatile than the motorized traffic uh, because of special event, because uh, it's not congestion yet, so, so you know the variation can be greater. So you need to have someone that, that verifies that data. And, and when you spend all this time verifying, you need to make sure you can document it and you can uh, track it and keep track of these different status. So some of our clients have contacted us um, uh, to help them look at the data on a continuous basis. And this is a tool that we developed in-house. Basically, every little rectangle of color is a piece of data. And this allows us to look for it at 30 counters for a week. And um, <coughs> if what basically we're looking for is our are red uh, little points. And these points are either outside the statistical uh, uh, expectancy or, or you know they are a little bit weird. And if you pay attention to this, like um, we can see that from here, this is a weekday uh, where we have the morning commute. Uh, it's kind of in an angle, but, but you can see the darker line, which is the morning commute, and then the darker line in the afternoon, which is the... So once you have this tool, you can see a lot of data very quickly. So the time that the humans spend in front of the screen are very efficient. So if we drill down to this count that was in yellow, uh, I'm sorry, in uh, red, um, so we can see there's this uh, this, this this weird count that, um, that, that looks like it may be problematic. But then if we drill again, we realize that um, it happens every week. So it's a bike ride that goes over this, and it multiplies the bike traffic by about 20. Uh, and so once you spend all that time, you know, digging into the data, you need to be able to say, I looked at this, I spent the time, and this data is good. Um, so inside your database, you need to have a, a way to track this, whether the data has been approved, rejected, or yet to be validated. So the human time that you spend on the data is, is captured and kept forever, because if someone needs to come back and look at this data five years from now. Um, some, so that was one aspect. Some other uh, data management initiatives. Um, they are permanent counters, they are short-term counters. Sometimes you have a little piece of data that you like to extrapolate to the, to the rest of the year. So uh, you can use uh, portable, you can use permanent counters that are the air, in the area that have similar profile. And once you find this, you can build your estimation 
of, uh, of, of counts. That sometimes can be useful for projects where you need to estimate the demand, but you, not so much, not the demand, but you need to estimate the number of people that have been to the location, but you don't necessarily have a permanent counter, so that's good. It can also be good if you need to recreate some data, like if you have some gaps in the data that you need for the analysis. This, these methods have been developed by universities like University of Manitoba, McGill, uh, Krista, uh, and, and we're <laughs> she's a university of her own. Um, well, you, you wait and see. So, um, great, another initiative that, that we're trying to do is to, to put combine different sorts of data together, whether it's GPS, accident, mm -hmm. weather data, so we can tell a more complete story. Uh, and finally, um, this is very close to my heart. So, so we have all these different databases and we want the data to go to the public. Uh, uh, and APIs are basically tunnels between databases and applications and a number of um, uh, uh, different things. All this knowledge, you know, all this verification information, it needs to be able to travel through different databases, through different places. So that's why the, the counts, they need to travel a little bag you know, that says, I've been verified, I'm a good count, I mean, I'm, you know, this count was good. And also all these sorts of other data, so people can build an ecosystem around the, 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 the data. So I'll stop here, um, and Chris is going to talk more about the national perspective, and Sean's going to do a conclusion for, for all of us, so thank you. Thank you, Jean-Francois and Winston. This was great. Um, so I am now at the University of North Carolina Highway Safety Research Center, and I'll be talking about the national perspective on when we pack these data up and try to put them in one centralized location nationally. Um, what does that look like, and what are the issues? The data types we're dealing with um, on the national level, we have manual counts, the old-fashioned clipboard approach, and we also have a lot of automated counts from many different vendors. They come in all sorts of different formats, and we're trying to put them all in one place. So I'm going to talk about those efforts. There are um, two efforts in the United States. The FHWA has their traffic travel monitoring and uh, analysis system, TMAS, and they have just created a new version of the travel traffic monitoring guide format for that. And um, I'll mention that again. Then um, Bike Ped Portal, which is an effort at Portland State University to put all the data in one place, um, and we have uh, uh, data there. Then in France, EcoCounter as a, a, uh, a database, and in, also in the UK. I'm not aware of any in Canada. Um, traffic Monitoring Guide, uh, Sean has worked on that. I'm really glad to have him here. Um, and there's a new com new version coming out in 2016. Any any day now, I hear. Um, I don't know when that'll happen, but um, th they have some additional f uh, formats for biking, including cycle tracks. So now you can indicate if your count is on a cycle track, which is handy. Um, and then later this year or next, I expect that we will be able to actually add count data to um, the federal highway uh, database. So that's exciting. And for Bike Ped Portal, we have data from about nine states right now, and we continue to add data from the National Bike Ped Documentation Project um, in collaboration with Alta. Um, so that's ongoing this summer. We have both manual and automated counts, permanent and mobile counters that Jean-Francois and Winston talked about, and we're counting on both segments and, and taking that data and putting it in the database, and also some intersections. So, um, Let's talk about quality. We've got all this data coming in from all over the country. How do we know if it's any good? Because it does not usually come with a little package that Jean-Francois mentioned saying it's validated. And we often deal with cities that don't have the wonderful program that Winston talked about. So we have data that has not been validated at all. Um, so I want to talk about some automated checks. Um, and if you want to know more about the adjustment for um, for known error, I've got to use this pointer. It's my dad's. <laughs> you can go to this, this great resource here, NCHRP 797. Um, and um, Jean-Francois talked about the data cleaning and the extrapolation. So what level of data quality you want kind of depends on what you're going to be using the data for. If I'm using it for a safety study and I need really high quality 
um, I may not want to trust any extrapolation that's based on some other counter at some other location. I may be very picky about what, what algorithm I use for such extrapolations. Whereas if I'm just look, doing a planning document to estimate general volumes in the future and predict other things, I may want to do some of those extrapolations. So it kind of depends on what your purpose is. Okay, data checks. We want to know about gaps in the data, high counts, um, repeating values, directional splits, um, and temporal shift. So the problems can vary by equipment type, and we've seen you know we've seen typical patterns with some equipment and other patterns with different equipment. So knowing your equipment and being familiar with it can really help. This is an example of 15 years of data, and you can see there's a lot of gaps there in the middle, um, and there's some really small gaps. So do we want to throw all this data out because we're missing some of it? No, we can use it. Um, but we want to also be careful when we see some of these gaps that may be indicative of counter malfunction. So the graph you're seeing here is um, data availability. It's not volume, it's data availability. So you can see that if, if, if we had just a big rectangle, that would mean we have all the data, but we're missing a lot of it here. Um, so we want to go back then and be a little cautious about when these lines are really close to it together. That may mean we're missing data due to malfunction. This is a graph from Greg Lindsay, who could not be here today, but wishes he could. And uh, this is some of the data he was looking at doing in visual inspection. And you see here that um, we have a big spike there at the far end, and then a, a bunch of zeros. So what's going on there? Um, maybe they closed the road, and then they had a big street party, right? Could happen. But it's also Minnesota in January, um, so maybe not in December, <laughs> probably. <laughs> yeah, it could be, yeah. We, we need a little more verification, but it's probably counter malfunction. Um, so he, oh, he said that, to tell you, that if you remove that data, that big spike, it's going to reduce your average count to, by about 10%. So it has an effect on your summary numbers. Um, so that is important to remove that if you want your accuracy within 10%. Now, this is a summary of what's going on, on with data quality around the country. Um, so we've got some from Sean, and he'll talk about later. And um, Seattle, University of Minnesota, um, Colorado DOT, North Carolina State, and us at PSU, or me, no. <laughs> Formerly at PSU. Um, I was there three months ago. Um, so we have different approaches. Generally, when we're looking for upper and lower bounds, we say three standard deviations. It seems to be kind of like a consensus we're, we're starting to see in this table. Um, when, and, and at PSU, we were trying 15 per hour, um, 1,500 counts per hour, and if it's over that, maybe there's a problem. Um, so that seems to be working okay. With the identical zero values, this is something FHWA is excited about. Um, six was not, six, you, you can get a lot of ones. Six ones together happens frequently, so that's not a good check. Um, but consecutive zeros, that's something we really need to check, because if we see a lot of zeros, could be a snowstorm, could be counter malfunction. Um, so we're seeing two or three days of those is when you want to flag. Um, and then directional splits, if you see like 90% to 10%, going 90% going one direction, 10% the other, if that's not the way it's supposed to be, that may be an, an issue and you want to check it. Um, so um, FHWA also is proposing some tests and they have here hourly counts and they're divide. what's interesting here is they're dividing it at the 100, hour, 100 counts per hour. So if you see less than 100 counts per hour, you do one test. If you see it over that, you do a different test. And similar by day, if it's over 1,000 counts per day at that station, you have a different set of tests than if it's below. So that's useful because when we see these low volume sites, um, you really have to do a different set of tests. And it's very different from motor vehicles where you have higher numbers. When you have a lot of ones, zeros, twos, nines, um, that's a different type of test that you're going to want to do on, in your automated. Okay, so um, I, could, I could say a lot more there, but I'm going to switch to temporal shift. Does anybody really know what time it is? Does anybody really care? 
Um, so <laughs> this is something that I think sneaks up on us. Um, and an example is the NCHRP 797. They were doing these studies across the country. They found that the piezoelectric was not working so well, and they published that. And then if you see, there's actually an errata um, showing that actually they were off by a few hours, and the counter was working great. So this is just a word to the wise. This does happen. Be very cautious that you are making sure your time is actually when the count occurred. Um, if you see a commute pattern and it's happening in the middle of the night, maybe your counter is off by 12 hours. So we see these types of errors. And um, we're also concerned about um, daylight saving time, which kind of not all equipment handles it the same way. So be cautious. So um, QC depends on purpose. Problems vary by data type. And um, because of our low volumes, we need to consider different tests than motor vehicles. I will now pass it on to Sean. Thank you. Thank you, Krista, and good morning, everybody. Um, I am Sean Turner, and I am a data geek. Um, I'm also a uh, research engineer at the Texas a and Transportation Institute. I'm going to focus on three key points that if you've been paying attention for the previous 30 minutes, hopefully this is a repeat of what you've heard. I think there is some consensus emerging about sort of data quality and the things that you need to do uh, for that. So I'm going to walk through these, these three key points um, and I'm going to show you some different examples uh, to sort of illustrate the point. The first point is that you really have to plan for quality that's consistent with uses. So you have to understand how uh, your count data is being used. Um, in some organizations, the count data may be gathered by a different group that actually uses it. If that's the case in your organization, you might want to sort of connect the dots and ju just so that the folks that are counting the data understand the different uses. Um, I'd also call this my, my, pithy, uh, my pithy lesson learned for this is don't spend a dollar to save a dime. Um, so I, I admitted that I'm a data geek. How many folks will admit that they're perfectionists? Okay, so there's, there's some perfectionists here. Um, so the, the point here is that if you understand how your data is being used, you don't agonize over a level of review and a level of detail that may not matter in some of your uses. Um, ultimately, data quality is based on and is defined by the fitness for the required uses. So it's really hard to define what is good data quality without understanding what the uses are. Um, here's my example. This is, um, this is a low volume site, right? And so you can see some typical patterns and then you see some drop offs. Well, we were actually reviewing, this is a week out of six years of data that we were reviewing, to sort of put that in context. Uh, the project manager was essentially saying, hey, we need, to, we need to get in here, we need to understand what's going on here and, and why that was out. And I thought about, okay, multiply that times 52 times 6. But if you think about it, um, do, it you're right, so this is suspect, but does it, does it really matter? Is it going to significantly change your answer if the average monthly count goes from 15 to 20? Um, 10, I think 10% is kind of, the, that is the rule of thumb, 10% accuracy, and that's largely come out of the motor vehicle world. I think to Krista and others' points, um, whenever we get to these low volume sites, we sort of need to rethink that sliding scale about whether 10% really is the right number. For higher volume, yes, I think that still is valid. Second key point is valuing eyes on the screen and local knowledge. I call this don't turn all the quality over to the bots. Bots are good, but don't turn all the quality over to bots. Um, human review is still really valuable, especially when structured contextual info is limited. In other words, if you don't have normal traffic patterns, special events, weather, things like that in a database and in a structured way that you can then cross compare to the incoming count data, you probably want to be looking at that. Um, this is just a typical example. I think just about anybody that has a counting program has an example like this, right, where you see, okay, we can see the weekends, we can see the weekdays, but huh, what's going on here? Uh, that, that's a possibility. Oh, yeah, that's right. Hey, it's Texas A&M Ring Day. Who knows what Ring Day is? 
It's actually, if you're a lawyer, someone back there knows. Um, so at, at, it's a big deal for Texas A&M seniors whenever they reach a certain uh, credit status. Um, they get to get, they, they're able to pick up their senior rings. This count location just happened to be by that location where they picked up the senior rings. Is somebody in D.C. going to know uh, what's happening? On the, is going to know about ring day? No. Um, the third key point is um, eyes on screen are good, but we don't have unlimited eyes. And so um, as Krista and, and Jean-Francois mentioned, um, we need to have automated rules to focus on problem areas. We've got to use these bots wisely to focus humans. Uh, I mean, the, so the, the foundation of this is based on statistical process control theory, right, where you have a process with some amount of variation. It fluctuates a little bit about the normal. You've got control limits that says, upper and lower control limits that says, whoa, something, you know, we got outside the control limits here. We need to check into that. That's if you're in a widget factory, but in fact, what we're doing is we're counting people biking and walking. <clears throat> and so this is, this would be a typical walking profile, a, a typical trail user profile. Um, and this would be, this could be based over a week, this could be multiple weeks, but it's the average profile. Essentially what you do, and, and, and Krista mentioned this, is you need to look at the variability from day to day, and you essentially construct, okay, well, what, what is, based on the uh, variability that we're seeing, what would be an acceptable lower control limit and what would be uh, an acceptable upper control limit? You're essentially setting the bounds for what you think you could expect on a particular trail, right? Such that you put in these control limits, you automate this in your software, and you, you've got incoming counts, the bots automatically compare your incoming counts for a particular day, and, and lo and behold, oh, something happened here during the middle of the day. Your software flags that and essentially puts that in a review queue. That, that is probably the most efficient way. It's the way that um, folks in the motor vehicle traffic monitoring world have been doing things for 20 plus years, and it really helps to focus on those problem areas, um, days and times. Part of the problem is, though, that things aren't always as neat and clean as this, and I would say it's, it's evolving into a science, but I think there's still a little bit of an art. One, one thing that I know that we've had problems with, again, especially on low volume sites, is that you tend to get a lot of day-to-day -day variation, and if you get a lot of day-to-day -day variation, what happens is your control limits essentially get very wide. And with very wide control limits, you have, a, you have a limited ability to identify something that looks out of whack whenever things routinely sort of vary a lot. Um, but again, the point is to, um, to try and focus the eyes on the screen as much as possible. Um, so th there are a number of rules that, again, have been developed on the motorized vehicle side. Some of those can be applied on the non-motorized side. Some of them not so much. I've listed a couple here. Krista had several others. Um, so in summary, I want to make sure that we've got time for questions. In, in summary, um, you got to think about the uses, and you got to make sure that you're sort of in the sweet spot in terms of not spending too much time, but spending enough time to get the quality that's, that's consistent with your uses. Um, you, you, I can't overemphasize this. Eyes on screen and local knowledge. That makes a big difference. But using that eyes on screen and local knowledge to really focus into those areas that are a little bit out of the ordinary. Um, so with that, thank you, and I think we'll take questions. They're, they're mobile. Okay. We use MyoVision. Okay. Uh, so we have, um, I believe, half a dozen of the cameras themselves. What we found is that um, we initially started using their analytics, so we would upload the data to them. Uh, we just found that with the staff that we have, I mentioned we have tw up to 25 auxiliary staff, 
Um, the price in terms of them doing the analytics and us having our staff do it, um, we actually see more value in having our own staff just watching the video um, because it's not minute to minute where, you know, like this, if there's low volumes, uh, our staff can just fast forward to the video. Um, and then so that saves in terms of the cost. Whereas Myovision, you're paying by the hour regardless of how complex the count is. Um, I've noticed you've still got tubes on the ground. Um, how yeah. does that impact with the change in bylaw with skateboards? Yeah, good question. Really good question. Uh, we recently actually had a skateboarder that took a really bad fall. Um, and so we're investigating that right now. We're looking at options to try and deal with this. I mean, obviously, um, when the bylaw came in, it was something that was on the top of my mind in terms of a hazard for, for skateboarders. Um, but at the same time, we also recognize that skateboarders likely have been using the separated bike facilities for some time, right? So right now, um, we've sort of engaged with manufacturers to see if we can get hoses that are you know, brighter, uh, more reflective. Uh, nobody makes anything like that right now, so if anyone knows anything like that, let me know, because we're really interested. We tried spray painting the hose, taping it, all this kind of stuff. But of course, with the hoses, we need to have them. Um, at those nine locations that we post on the web, um, we need to have data all the time. Uh, we have not, we, there, we, we really don't want to have to extrapolate the data uh, from the permanent counter. So what we rely primarily on, on those locations that are posted on the web is um, a permanent counter that counts continuously. It's embedded in the road, um, but obviously, uh, like any technology, it can fail, right? Anything can happen to it, or even there's vandalism. So we actually will have a backup hose counter right beside it. So if that fails, we actually have the hose counter data uh, that we can just fill in the gaps in data, right? So it's really critical that we have those hose counts. Um, and then even on top of that, like as I mentioned, we have staff that will go out on a monthly basis, sit there at those counts for about three hours, and then they'll come back to the office and compare their counts with the hose count and with the permanent count, and make sure it's within 5%. Can I just say one thing more yeah. about the hose Sure, go ahead. Um, so Portland has a lot of hose counters that they leave out 365 days a year also, and they're using these really, really small diameter mini, uh, mini tubes. I watched a blind person walk over it, no problem, and I haven't heard any complaints from the skateboarding community, so um, that, that seems to be a decent help. Okay, thanks, we should talk. Uh, was this a question for me? Uh, yeah, possibly. Uh, just a quick uh, hose question while we're on this topic from someone who truly admits he doesn't know anything about the technology. If you lay down a hose across a roadway for the purposes of capturing you know, motor vehicle um, movement, and I ride over it with my bicycle, am I not counted, or am I counted as a motor vehicle, or is there a, a pressure sensitivity? Or how yeah, it so they, it's by the, the speed and also by the uh, axle. The axle. Okay. Length. Length. That's why that's there. <laughs> and it yeah. may be that, so in the motor vehicle, that they may, it may be that there's not enough air that gets pushed through the tube to actually activate the yeah. sensor. So it can, uh, if the purpose is to capture vehicle movement, uh, bicycles aren't being sort of inadvertently added to that. And being they, so they can be classed. So based on the axle length uh, and speed, the, if it's a vehicle counter that's designed to do that, um, we haven't found a vehicle counter that's accurate enough to count um, vehicles and like accurately count cyclists. We, we tried. Um, Kristen. Sorry. We, um, Sarisha Kotori, who's in the audience, and I um, just completed a study for Oregon Department of Transportation where we looked at five ma um, tube counters from five manufacturers and found that, yes, you can count both motor vehicles and bicycles, um, but uh, it is challenging, and so you want to ideally not place those tube counters in a place where you have both, both going over them because one is going to mask the other if you have a motor vehicle passing a bicycle at the same time. That's just not something that technology can handle. Um, but there are algorithms that are on the market right now um, that can differentiate between those two um, and vendors that sell that. Um, but the accuracy is just not going to be as good in a mixed environment where you have motor vehicles and bicycles as it would be on a single bicycle, a bicycle only facility. Primarily, but then uh, probably for Lance and Diane. 
Um, when you're talking about those spikes, uh, as we were talking about the ring day, as an advocate, we try to create those spikes by having events and getting people out. Exactly. So what's to stop us if we have a, I don't know, like a bikini February bike ride <laughs> that we did and had people out from having the people who are analyzing the data to extract that because they assume it's an anomaly. Like, how do we provide the context for the people who are handling the data? Communication. I mean, essentially just talk to them. And if, if someone, like I said, if ideally, if like if Google or Amazon were in charge of national bike pedestrian counting, they would have a database that says, here's all the special event days, here's the things that are likely to affect the counts. Provide that to your data collectors and say, hey, this is valid. Um, ideally, I think they would have a mechanism within their database to say, to tag it as a special event. Um, you may, there may be a case where you want to generate sort of average statistics, or, and, and you, may want, you may or may not want to include those special events, but absolutely, if it happened, you'd want to count it, for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we've broken your counter a few times. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I talked about the API and the role of the API and the fact that the data needs to travel in all directions, um, you could have, uh, a city could have a portal where people can comment on the data and they can say, well, this is questionable, you know, and people can put their comments, but as this needs to travel back and forward, like it needs to have a, a channel of communication. And we, we uh, national database people, actually, w when we have the interns adding the data to the database, we go back and we do a Google search for an event happening on that day so that we don't, so if it's a big event, we're going to catch it. Unfortunately, if it's a little event and you didn't have a lot of publicity online, we might miss it, but we do our best. Um, you mentioned the difficulty of setting kind of the standard range for the low volume counts. Do you ever set like a different standard deviation for different locations? Uh, y yes, I think that's something that I didn't mention, but I think is important is because di di essentially different sites are going to have different patterns. Now some of that, and, and may have more or less variability. Um, and so it, it could be that, uh, I think it is, by, by customizing it on a site by site basis, I think would be ideal. And then how long do you usually run the counters before you kind of tweak that and set it? Uh, I would say at this point that's probably more of an art than a science. I mean, you you would want to set it. I would say you know for a couple of weeks of data, maybe at a at a minimum. If you're doing portable counts, obviously, if you're doing continuous, um, you would want to set it based on a longer period of time and a period of time that is reflective of the season that you're in. So it, it varies. It also it also depends on the users. Some of our users use the automatic alerts as almost a report, so they set up the thresholds really close, so they follow it uh, almost on a day-to-day -day basis, they'll get the email. Um, so it depends, to answer your question. And to make it even more complex, sometimes for the same site, it will be different in the season. Mm -hmm. So in Montreal, where we have a lot of snow, all the checks that we use in the summer, where we have like 8,000 bikes, do not work. Like you can't use percentage in the in in the winter where you have between twenty and two hundred. So uh, yes. Is there a good question over there? Yes, sir. Um, Federal Highway seems to be implying they're going to require before and after mm -hmm. counts for for projects in the in the team um, the separated bikeway guide and comparing a mixed use count to an automated count seems like it might be a problem. Uh, data quality and, and <laughs> what length of time do we need to, do we have any indication of what a before count needs to be? Um, so I, I did some work a few years ago on, on the length of time and um, it's been followed up by uh, other universities and it seems like about a week is what I recommend, some say 24 hours, um, so that's the range you're looking at and for motor vehicles it's 48 hours. So. During peak season? Yes. You definitely want to count during peak season. You don't want to count in the winter in Minnesota. <laughs> um, w w uh, so I live in a city where they use host counters and collect data for motor vehicles on every city street. And I can go on the website and pull all that up and I can know which 
how many cars are going in each direction and every point where they count. <coughs> and except for a uh, half a dozen permanent counters for bicyclists, um, they're not collecting any other data. So uh, I understand what you presented, but I'm looking for the lowest cost automated counter that I can say, okay, you need to start collecting more data in other places. Are there hose counters or some other technology that is cheap and portable that could be deployed to try and balance the equation between long-term transportation decisions that are made based on cars versus some other user? So um, the study that Sarisha and I did, um, and that it's online, it's on Oregon Department of Transportation's website. Um, it's report seven, SPR 772. Um, it has uh, recommendations for how to use existing motor vehicle count tubes mm -hmm. that are owned by state DOTs and others to count bicycles. And when it has, um, actually there's a companion um, booklet that we created to help state DOTs and other DOTs who count motor vehicles to incorporate bicycling into their plan. That's fantastic because the, the traffic engineers keep telling me that their host counters won't count. It, it, you, they can be really, really wrong. Yeah. We found that if they use their standard procedure, you can, you're counting 30% of the bikes. Yeah. And that's with the, the manufacturers that huh. say they can count bicycles with like one of the, one of the manufacturers. Had 30%, okay. er, no, only counting 30% of the bicycles. So that's a huge undercount. Yeah. So you can do it really, really wrong if you have a group of people who don't care. Yeah. So you want to test them. That's the problem. Yeah. I just want to add on to that. I live from the city that uh, Sean mentioned. I'm the assistant in fact here for Brooklyn and Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, we actually do have a permanent money count stations. Mm -hmm. We have about uh, a few thousand of them actually. We we were mostly that uh, in, in induction groups oh, on, on tap, okay. uh, but we do have a problem with the uh, with uh, you know, the tubes. And those were installed in nine, the nineties, right? The, well, that's the, the early two thousands. The the loops you have, right? Yeah, we, we we are we are continuing to expand them. Yeah, yeah, we got quite a few now. That's great. I just want to comment, uh, Charles, on your question. Um, you talk about cost of equipment. If you're going to have a portable count program, the real cost will be the labor related to this. The equipment is almost not relevant. So that's why the management is, is mm -hmm. more important. So. Well, apparently I have a, a second part to my question because apparently we have thousands of permanent <laughs> counters, but um, I, I don't know. I, see, I still see long-range transportation decisions made based on motor vehicle counts. So how do we use the automated data? Like how, I, I mean, mean we've, I we've keep hearing that there's not the army of yeah. manual counters to yeah. double check well, the automated ones. I think we've gone a long way. Yeah. You know, in the last 10 years, my first mm -hmm. bike ped conference was Madison, mm -hmm. uh, which is your city, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so, <laughs> I mean, the, the discussion is much more complex. You know, if you look at what the city of Vancouver has done with the data justifying, you know, removal of travel lanes and things like things are changing and the data is helping in, in the more general. So I think there's hope. Um, I think we have one more question. Yeah. Have any of you experimented with mobile GPS based data collection benchmarks against uh, anything? Yeah. Um, yes, we think it's very valuable to combine different sources of data. Um, every type of data has its, has its limits, but um, it can be much more powerful, and you can get you can get more out of your automated counters investment. And you know there are tools like our company. We're trying to work on some initiatives to combine different sources of data. Uh, it's to be like it's not perfect, but it depends what you want to do. So. And that's one of the things that Sean and uh, Krista said is, 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 yeah, what's the purpose? Why do you want the data? And, and maybe you can accept more, uh, maybe you can accept data that is not as, you know, solid for, for different types of purpose, if that makes sense. Can I, can I just add to that? Actually, somebody's working on that. There maybe in the next six months to a year, they'll have better, because you can do it for motor vehicles. But right now, it's really hard to distinguish pedestrians and bicyclists from, um, they're, they're working on algorithms that will allow them to do that, so. Uh -huh. Yeah, one more thing on that. There are certainly people working on on combining these data sources in, in, in many places that, because that's really important. My one caution is to use um, the trace data from apps without 
correlating it with counts means you're getting a very small sample or, or a biased sample. And so I, I really urge people to com combine the count data with the data you're getting from apps for the best use of both. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.